Right, let's just give it a little longer, folks, for a few more people to come in. Are you getting a lot of prompts, Tracy, to let people in? Yeah. I believe yeah. it caches them, so next time it might not be so so frequent. I was like, oh, no, I have to get, let everybody in. It's cool. Mm. <laughs> and the good thing to know is um, if if you're late for some reason, somebody else from Chain Guard will be able to let people in. Oh, perfect. So that's what happened when we had... So I created the original one on the Red Hat and other folks at Red Hat could let folks in for me. So awesome. Yeah. Good amount of redundancy there then. Yeah. Well, let's just have a look at the um who we have. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Okay, see so we got um we got Bob. Okay, I'm sure Bob will trickle in shortly. So, um, right, we're recording, so that's good. So um, we're going to kick off with the agenda for the community chair. Okay, so um, Tracy is our new community chair. Okay, great to have you. Thank you so much for your service, Tracy. Um, really good to leave it in a capable pair of hands there. And um, so what we're going to do, I already had a, a good handover session with Tracy earlier. So, you know, why, why not cut to the chase? And we're going to get Tracy can actually chair this in the first meeting. So what I'll do is I, I can unshare if you like, and you can share um, the agenda yourself. Yeah, or You are happy to do that while I get used to all the admits. I have to. <laughs> sure, um, sure. But uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's an honor to be doing this and I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Luke for um, getting the meeting to, uh, yes, so so well run and uh, I hope to keep that up and keep growing the community um, and getting it bigger and better. And yeah, I look forward to working with you all in this new capacity. So that being said, uh, let's jump into the agenda items and uh, the project round robin. Uh, so does anyone have anything for recall? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so we wanted to just talk about our new sharding approach, which we worked on in the last week. Um, so for those who weren't there in last week's meeting, um, we had initially the plan for sharding required around 20 minutes of downtime. And we discussed kind of reducing that downtime as much as possible. Um, I don't know how interested people are in the technical details of how this happened. <laughs> um, but I submitted a PR last week, which should get our downtime pretty much as low as we can at this point. Um, the only like risk is the time it takes for old pods to be spun down by the record deployment and new ones to come up because the old pods would be writing to the old shard and the new pods will be writing to the new one. Um, we're getting around this by scaling down the deployment to one pod before we actually um, replace it and start the new deployment. Um, so that way um, entries, even if they are added to the old log, um, the new pod, the new pod as it spins up um, should be aware of those new entries. And then once everything is running smoothly, we'll uh, re-increase the number of pods up to three. Um, yeah, Luke. Cool, nice work. So I think I had a time approximately 10 seconds, 10, 20 seconds, you, you estimate? Yeah, I would say it would probably take that much yeah. time. So, so um, I was discussing this with Lily and, uh, and my, my thoughts are, I think this could be possible for us being an experimental, okay, with what we should try and do if it's possible we should look for a time period where activity is at its lowest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, I don't want anybody to get up at 4 a.m. To, to, to do that. So, you know, you know, we might need to sort of look at what sort of time zone that plays out at for, for the people that are working on this. The other thing is uh, when we go into full GA production, if we do need to shard, it would be good to have a proposal so that we can do that seamlessly. Okay, with, with no downtime. So one of the things I was thinking of earlier, 
we could even do something like we could have like a shim something like redis mm -hmm. which possibly um it can poll so that as soon as that port is uh available so the services come offline it could immediately perhaps cache the entries into redis and then when the new shard comes up then it could spool those entries to uh, inclusion into the log so that that's probably a bit of a, a hacky approach but i'm just thinking something along those lines where we could have some sort of i don't know if the word is shim or intermediate mm -hmm. queue system that just somehow will um cache those uh, the the other thing as well i did raise an issue about this is we could look at how different clients can handle this as well so if it's like a 10 20 second timeout and clients have their own um retry mechanism that's possible but we should definitely shoot for getting seamless i think how yeah. we do that as yet i don't know but so it'd be good to to sketch some sort of proposal out first maybe yeah uh, i can see lily um, yeah, I wanted to add to that. I plugged in the uh, the issue that Priya had made last week around this um, this topic. So we have a solution right now for the experimental mode, and maybe we can use that same issue for thoughts around how to get this more seamless in the future, mm. um, including like this Redis thing. And then I had been brainstorming about having a separate API endpoint for sharding that would help do the switchover. So like maybe that would help too. These are not things that would be immediate and we don't need to do them now, but it would be like a good place for discussion. Yeah. So I guess the main thing is that if we need to do something pre-GA to accommodate having that seamless experience, we make sure that we don't have that technical depth for when we, because once we are GA, it gets more difficult then, if you see what I mean. So so we leave ourselves enough space to to be able to, I can definitely, I can definitely start brainstorming some plans for a more seamless sure. experience, which we awesome. will want. Um, for now, I think with the current plan, we're probably okay for this first round of sharding because we're only going to be sharding staging, and I don't think anyone's really using it anyway. So, yeah, um, we should be okay there. Um, but yeah, before I say it's a good call, before we announce GA, we should have at least know how we plan on sharding yeah. production sure it's simple and then um we will then need to work out a date a date for ga right yeah so um i think order, bob wanted to talk about that on the tack i can hear someone so, sorry i was just saying a point of order i can see this on the agenda but it's further down six door ga it does come up later yeah i'm sorry i'm sort of branching off into that so um yeah let's get to well, we kind of we covered that already, so we can strike yeah. that one off. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a good point. So um, <clears throat> I know the date. Um, so we'll come back to that on the date. tack as well. So yeah, we can propose some dates, and then if the the tech wants to take those into consideration, sure. decide. But let's come back to that. Um, so we'll, is there anything else on sharding? Or shall we move on to Hayden's? I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Hayden, do you want to talk about timestamping authority? Yeah, um, there's a lot more details uh, on this issue, but the high level summary of this is I've been thinking a bit about the purpose of the timestamping authority um, and whether it's necessary or not. And I think as it's currently uh, deployed, it doesn't really add anything of value. The original purpose of the timestamping authority was that, you know, if you wanted to have, um, if you didn't want to trust recourse clock, you could have some third party provide a signed timestamp and admit that to the log. Um, but ultimately for recourse running both the timestamping authority and the log, the trust models, the exact same, and you're really not getting any benefit out of the timestamping authority. So, um since we're pre-GA, I think it's the, the right time to have this conversation. Um, feel free to chime in on the issue. Um, we have a couple different options. There's one option which is removing it entirely, which is my personal preference. 
the other options are splitting this off from ReCore um, to make it uh, its own service that it can run, uh, that can be run. Um, if we go with this approach, there is some more work that we need to do because the underlying RFC that describes uh, how to create signed timestamps is a bit complex. And we have a few places where we are not conforming to that RFC right now. This is once again, a reason I really just don't want to keep this around. Um, there are uh, many existing implementations of timestamping authorities out there. Uh, I think we should be pointing folks to those if they really want those. Um, there's other options, which is newer timestamping protocols, ultimately, uh, unless we want to dis uh, bring down the log, we need to still support the um, timestamping type in ReCore. Uh, but, um, you know, there's an option of supporting different uh, types of signed timestamps. So, so that said, um, feel free to take a look. Um, you know, the, I don't know if we'll get this change in um, soon. I think there's some more conversation to be had. Um, I've got a PR out to, to remove it just to see what that'll look like. Um, but we don't have to get that in yet until we have a bit more conversation. I, I'll have to reply on the issue. I, I think we should keep it somehow. If we want to split it off from Recore or something, that's fine. Um, and, and the main point for me when we put it in was actually just compatibility with systems that require those, like signed jars, signed Git um commits those kind of things with xmime and then because we log those automatically to record it's actually like a much better system than the existing ones you'd be pointing people to um yeah i i think if we wanted to it would probably want to be its own service i mean we can decide if it lives outside of records code base entirely um there's a little bit of work that needs to be done and I, we can continue more on the issue, I think, about this. I, I'm, I, I think there's a lot of existing systems out there. And I mean, I think we can even explain to people how to just do this in OpenSSL, which is probably far easier than trying to maintain a service that runs this. Cool. Nathan? And, um, is, is the time stepping authority uh, the thing that creates the RFC thirty one sixty one entries in the log, or is it more yes. or different things than that? Okay, yeah, just just to give everyone a bit of context, there there are um, only like one hundred and ninety six in the entire log, and we create maybe like four or five per week at this point, just to get a context. And the entire log has like over two million entries now. So just in terms of use total log, it's vanishingly small. That doesn't line up with the number Hayden shared. Is there something wrong? That's that's curious. So I, yeah. I was using cloud monitoring to gather that. I wonder if there's something wrong in the metrics. Because I, I would um, trust I'm, I'm counting the I'm counting the entries, not the API uh, endpoints. I'm not sure why someone will be smacking the API and not creating entries, but um, Can, yeah, in like all of the entries that exist, there's only uh, just under 200 um, that are type RFC 3161. Interesting. OK, um, well, I can go back and take a look at the metrics. I mean, that, that's even more justification that there really is not much use for this at this point. Um, I'm curious if you know the, the um, date of the first entry. So yeah. to be it's, fair, that was probably us testing. So that was probably a while ago. The date of the first entry is June. It's on the week of June 13th, 2001. Okay, that was when this. Yeah, that was the when the code was first created. Okay. Yeah, and there are you know a handful of entries per week, but it's it's very very tiny. Okay, great. So if no other comments or questions for now, yeah, please take a look at the issue and uh, give some feedback. Right, moving on. A top level entry key, Eddie. You want to take this? Yeah, this was, uh, I think I talked about this a week or two ago. This was feedback from PyPI folks and I think a few others on the call, so they ran into this as well. Um, it was a pitch to change the top level key from being a dynamic UUID key to just having a static structure that's easy to parse. Um, I think Luke, you plus one this. Bob said that we could do this in gRPC. 
I mean, anyone have thoughts? I can start working on this if people want to do it and start coordinating with all the client libraries. Go ahead, Nathan. Isn't the UUID importantly the like the an important guarantee that the body hasn't been modified? Yeah. So the that 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 pitch right there. So if we just keep the UID separate as a, a static top level key and then move the entry into its own key. Um, it definitely breaks the clients, but it gives a consistent non-dynamic key structure. Okay, gotcha, I see. Yeah, it doesn't get rid of the data. It just changes the structure. Right now the key is literally the UID string rather than the string UID, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, that's so obnoxious. I remember that, never mind, I get it. I haven't even written code for this, and it drives me nuts just thinking about it. Like I've I've had to deal with like data masquerading as keys before, and it's it's horrifying. It's always a pain in the ass. Yeah, having written like two parsers for this log now, uh, it's always annoying because you have to iterate the keys. There's only ever one of them. Then you take the key. It's just it it feels awkward every time. I, a new structure would be lovely. I strongly agree in the chat, Luke. Do you want to go? Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say, I think the main thing we need to consider is unifying change with the clients, really. So I guess cosine is the main one, so that we make sure that uh, as the release, that there's some sort of co coordination, really, around the releases, so that, yeah. Jason? Is this something we can address with an accept header? If you accept the recore response version one, you get the old, well, who knows what the default would be. But uh, if you say in your request, I accept recore response version two, we'll give you this new good one. And then we migrate clients to use that. And at some point, turn off the old one. I think that's a good idea. But the, the problem there is everything's at version zero, zero, one. And I don't think, I don't know, do you, do you all have like, a contract out there now that things won't break before we call this GA? Jack, so that, that's actually the, the record type, I guess. So, um, uh, yeah, okay. Were you thinking of API versioning or record type versioning, Jason? I was thinking of API response type versioning. The, the schema of the entry object wouldn't change okay, yeah, yeah. in either case, but we may be just adding another type of version, which will only be confusing. Mm -hmm. This is one reason maybe to, to handle this with gRPC potentially. Mm -hmm. um, this was kind of the same thing we did with Seal, where we took advantage of the fact that we were gonna switch over to gRPC, which also has a, an HTTP compatibility layer, um, but we versioned the API that's a V2 API now, um, and we fixed a couple of things that we didn't uh, like about the first API. All right, so as people are going to build community clients in other languages, are we going to expect them to use gRPC and not have a, a REST API anymore, or what's the plan there? Colcio uh, exposes both, I think, using gRPC Gateway or something like that. Um, but then we, it, we do support both v1 and the v2 API at the moment in Colcio, and then I guess we'll deprecate v1. That's right. Good. I, can, Go I can suggest that um, I would want to keep uh, a REST API. Um, for the very simple reason that Ruby Gems doesn't want to take on a sea of dependencies and gRPC is, is a beast and talking a little bit out of class, it doesn't get much love from Google in Ruby land. Yeah, I, I did discuss this with Bob. I'm not sure if he's on the call. He agreed that we would run both. So, you know, you could, you could, uh, you could pull up Recore and decide which interface type you want to run. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. There's there's no plan to remove the REST API. I think a yeah. discussion would be around when we remove uh, the older version of the REST API, like with Folsio. Our our plan, for example, for Folsio going forward is we won't add any new features to the older REST API to encourage folks to move to the new yeah. one. Um, you know, and then we'll have to probably uh, we can choose to maintain some sort of REST client if we want to. Otherwise, you know, we can say if you want client generation, use gRPC. Apu, do you want to go ahead? Uh, so, so the new gRPC uh, API has a REST proxy. So, um, 
it, 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 it exposes a REST API. And I think from Java land, we're going to use gRPC just because the client generation is easier and I don't have to write out these weird requests. Uh, but uh, they should both be available. And Luke? Yeah, and just to extend on that, do we know what the coverage of gRPC is across different languages? So uh, there's we've got a Python library, we've got the SIG store library. There's a recall crate, in fact. So I, I'm we, figure it's, I'll, is it fairly that universal? Maybe that needs to go in the issue, I'm not sure. Yeah. If you're supporting both, I think um, mm. maybe folks can share details on the issue. So we know Re, Re, uh, Ruby is not very uh, good. Nathan, with also did, did we end up like sticking the gRPC gateway in front of v2? I guess the other option here is that if there's an open API um, spec, you can code gen off that. If it's Red or in Ruby, I'm not sure if that's a thing, but um, that might be another gateway for folks that are trying to do code gen. Okay, any closing thoughts? Otherwise, uh, yeah, I think let's keep that going in the issue. And yeah, no, I think that's great feedback coming from going going out into the world in PyCon. So thanks, Eddie, for raising that. Yeah, well, if, if we want to get this in before GA, though, we should make a decision on it soon. Hmm. Right, Let's moving on to Falsio, uh, Nathan, refactor. Yeah, uh, not really a big thing here. I proposed some refactoring work in Falsio a while ago. That's happening now. Thanks so much, Hayden, for a million reviews. Um, basically, this should make it uh, quite a bit easier in the future if we add, need to add more identity issuers and logic around sticking things in certificates from an identity issuer. So if that interests you, there's lots of PRs happening now in, in Falsio. Questions, comments? Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, cosine, anyone, anything on cosine? Okay, let's go on to root signing. So Asura and Hayden. Um, uh, because Asura's not here, I'll start off by saying uh, thank you to Asura, who has been doing an absolutely fantastic job. Um, throughout this. Um, so we, uh, the tough route is expiring in about one day. Um, so we have been going through the process of getting all the signatures from the root key holders. Um, that has been completed as of last night. So thank you to everybody for uh, quickly getting um, signatures in. Uh, there's a couple more steps that we need to run through to generate the rest of the um signed metadata that's with online keys and then a final um commit and push make sure everything works um so that'll be uh by end of day um we should be all good there's no worries about needing to um push this new tough route to cosign yet we will probably once this is in make an update to cosign um so that this is the um the default route um but yeah everything's been going well so far um if you want to follow along there's the root signing repository uh, where PRs have been coming in. Awesome. Do you have a link to that? You can drop into the notes. I will do that. Right. Comments, questions? Awesome. Thank you, Hayden. Oh, wait, go ahead, Marina. I just wanted to throw out that if anyone wants to check anything in the process, there's a script you can run to verify um, all the different metadata that was generated in this process. Nice. Okay, six to GA. Um, I don't know if we have any more downtime discussion, but uh, one thing raised was related to the GA announcement timing. And Priya, you still around? Yeah. You, we had some thoughts about that. Do you want to go? Um, ahead? Well, we thought I was. It could be nice to sort of target the open SSF conference in June, um, and then. We would have 
I think around six weeks. Um, yeah, what, what do people think? Well, it's, I, yeah. oh, go ahead. I would just say, maybe we do this kind of uh, systematically. I think we need to kind of go through all of the open tasks, um, figure out what's left, figure out if there's any timing you know, issues. You know, the I think recourse is probably the area mm -hmm. where there's the most question of what we have left to do. Um, and just make sure that we give ourselves some runway, you know, at least a few weeks uh, where we can iron out any bugs. Six weeks feels close. Maybe maybe I'll say that more the same place. Okay. I think I'll say that if we keep pushing it, we're just going to keep finding new things, right? Like, like mm -hmm. GRPC, you're moving the timestamp for all things that we've just kind of came up with because we've kept stretching this out. So I feel like some line in the sand is going to be good. Um, to work backwards yeah, from I, directions, I guess. Like there was an original list of items, I think, that just kind of kept growing rather than shrinking. I if if I were to kind of have a little like retrospective on what happened, I'd probably say that we had more of a conversation around what are the productionization items, but we didn't give a lot of thought to are there any things we want to do with the API before we make this change? Um, or before we switch over to GA and, and we have to have some API stability. Um so I think that would probably be something for you know future API versions that we think a little bit more about both of those. Um, and for what it's worth, I think like the productionization stuff has come along very nicely. I think there's um, not too much left around there that we have to do. I think it's just this discussion around what do we want to get into the API that we call V1 at this point. Yeah, I think it's just time to time box that. Right? This is just one of those things that could go forever. No API is ever going to be perfect. Simon, do you want to comment and maybe we'll come back to you, Hayden? Yeah, I just had a quick question. So, hi, everyone. I'm Simon Kent. I'm um, new to the Ghost team at Google. Um, is, is there a uh, scoping document for GA that, like, what, what's in what's in scope for GA and what we're announcing and promising um, when it goes to GA? Can someone link that in the doc? If it exists? I can link that in the doc. Yeah, I think we heard um, the quick TLDR is we had one, but then it's like we did find more and more things that it's like, mm -hmm. well, let's not break the API afterwards after GA. So let's do it all before. And then that list just kept growing. So um, somewhat to what Hayden said, it's like we just kept, we, we didn't go thoroughly enough on the, the full feature set of what what did we want to GA with. Luke? I was just going to say, going forward, it might be useful to implement some sort of feature freeze for this sort of stuff. And um, I'll look at um, what we can do there. Great. Plus one on that, um, productionizing new features every couple of weeks was not one. No, sure. Yeah. Great. And uh, yeah, just from the other side, like the non-engineering side, um, I think that there's nice benefits of doing a, a big announcement where we pull together all the different communities, um, do a coordinated announcement, and it makes it much more of a celebration. If you can tie it to an in-person event, that's quite nice because you've got folks on the ground who can cheer it on, or we can have some special swag or something, which, which is pretty fun. Um, so I do think connecting it to an event has, has some nice benefits for just um, amplifying that message. And maybe it sounds, if we're in that ballpark anywhere, can get the ball rolling on uh, working with the OpenSSF to draft an announcement and we can start collecting um, folks who can contribute in terms of like quotes uh, and things. It's always nice to give folks a heads up if they need approvals. Um, so yeah, I can, I can start running with some of those things. So maybe in um, this Monday's uh, GA meeting, we can go through the open tasks um, and see if what we have open, uh, with what we have open, if June, end of June would be a reasonable date. Yeah, so task review, yeah, feature freeze dates, and yeah, let's get the ball rolling on the 
non-engineering activities. Anything else? Okay, great. Let's move on to infrastructure working group. Luke? So yeah, I can cover this one because um, this was, uh, I've been speaking to Carlos a fair amount this week. And um, at the moment we got, I think close to 30 repos. Okay, and they all require management. And, and Carlos was finding it a bit sort of challenging having to ask people that had admin to do certain things. So there's a lot of other stuff. We hit some limits around team management and, and just lots of things really. So, so we thought it would probably be prudent to have, it doesn't need to be a sort of um, something that's forever ongoing, but some sort of infrastructure working group that can tackle all of this. So Carlos is happy to be the point person on that. And he's put together a proposal there. And there is actually a, a meeting. Let me just look at my calendar to remind myself. May 24th, I believe. 24th, yes, thank you. So uh, that will be the first working group meeting. So anybody that's interested in, in helping out with SIG Store Infra, I uh, do recommend you come along. This is everything really, GitHub Actions, automations, uh structural team structures how maintainers are onboarded and offboarded and all of that sort of stuff really yeah it, this is a big plus one because like i was yeah. just talking to carlos of releases well we we'll release first you need release focio then record then the cosine hcli oh. and then you need the helm charts and then it's like the scaffolding if you want to bring up the entire thing so it's like yeah. even if you actually want to use all the pieces there's a lot of releases that needs to happen in order for any one individual piece you, if you want to. Very much. Project. Yeah, as and that, I mean, that even came up on this meeting, this uh, idea of release coordination and so forth. So yeah, I do agree. Awesome. So yeah, folks, check out the proposal and uh, yeah, if you can join the kickoff and yeah, thanks Carlos for spearheading this one. Okay, next one is the TSC meeting. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, so so as discussed, um, we're, we're opening up the TSC for anybody to attend. And uh, the first one will be May the 12th, 11 ET. Again, it's on the calendar, the community calendar. Um, we have a relatively light agenda. You should find the agenda on the calendar entry. and. Um, but uh, I do take a look. Uh, generally, will be uh, the so this is the main community meeting. Okay, and it will stay that way. Uh, the TSC is more for project approvals, anything related to governance and so forth. So, uh, so we try to be fairly autonomous around how community operates. It's just where some sort of voting decision is needed. Yes. Okay, so May 12th for the kickoff TSC public meeting. Okay, KubeCon EU. Okay, so um, next week we're all out in sunny Valencia, and or um, well, some of us are. Sorry, those that aren't. And um, uh, there is a no need to access this unless you're you're going. There is um, a spreadsheet which just tracks the who's covering the booth. So we're going to have a SIG store. I should have backfilled that with the information that we're going to have a SIG store booth at KubeCon EU. So um, this is just to help um, state who's going to cover it at certain times and so forth. Okay. And um, so if you are going and you'd like to come along, do request access or send me a message on Slack and I can add you. Okay. Um, if you're all going to be there, but you're busy or you don't feel you know, you've been around six store enough to be able to help on the booth. Do come and see us. That'd be great to see anybody. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, thanks for pulling that together, Luke. And uh, yeah, you and Red Hat and making it happen. It's awesome. Okay, let's get to any other business. Uh, VLA. Yeah, so uh, there's been talk about pulling co-signed the webhook out into its own repo went through the tsc and got some comments and plus ones and whatnots um so um 
I'm going to apologize up front because I'll make mistakes when I do that. So uh, I will not even uh, start that work until uh, after KubeCon. But I also wanted to go ahead and get more um, uh, uh, visibility into it. And also, uh, if there are folks who would be uh, willing to help with any of that work, that'd be fantastic. Ping me. Okay, generic package type, Eddie. Yeah, this was just a, a conversation that came out of the, the PyPI folks again. Um, I don't know if, Jocks, if you've put any thought into what kind of type you'd want when you think about like a Ruby package. Um, but the conversation was, do we create a type per package manager? So I have a PyPI type, a Ruby gems type, or do we abstract that all into a generic package type that satisfies most of everyone's use cases? Um, the pitch was to use the, the PURL uh, syntax, which has the additional modifiers at the end, which should be able to address most things. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, yes. I, <clears throat> I've long felt that a generic package uh, thing was going to be necessary, uh, or that putting it a different way, that it would be very wasteful if everybody came up with their own. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of that. I haven't given much thought to the details of it. I also um for foreshadowing believe that we'll get to the point where we have a great many different things that are going to be generic across package ecosystems that get written into the log so things like push events uh yank uh change of ownership enablement to say enablement of mfa perhaps like a bunch of security sensitive things that we want logged in the open um will eventually wind up there and i think those should be generic as well um there was something else I was going to say, but unfortunately, it's it's slipping my mind now. Uh, but the short answer is yes, I think it's a good idea. Oh, yes, uh, that was it. Um, definitely, as this evolves or as this firms up, um, please bring it to the Securing Software Repos Working Group, because that's where all the repo folk are hanging out. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for highlighting that, Eddie. Okay, Ooh, a good one. Maven six to update. Is that Jason? Uh, hi. Um, <clears throat> I've been trying to deploy to Maven Central all morning. I don't think I've quite made it, but I almost have a working version of the plugin uh, deploying everything to Maven Central uh, intact. So I hope that tomorrow I can actually do the full demo and I. I think I'll be done in about 15 minutes, but I didn't quite make it for the meeting. Um, so I'm working on this uh, on behalf of ChainGuard. So yesterday was my first day. So uh, today I hope to finish the at least first revision of the Maven goodies. Um, Bob is going to take a look at the code that I made. And then no dire rush, but uh, maybe sometime in the next couple of days, um, the code will get moved over to SigStore. And uh, I'll start trying to wire it into um, everybody's projects. <laughs> so that's it. So, Look. Yeah, so, so great work. Nice to have you here, Jason. And um, if you like, you could do a demo on the community meeting sometime if you want. And, yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to try tomorrow um, at the open SSF meeting, and, and I'll record one as well. Oh, fantastic. Wonderful, yeah. And if you want, we could also coordinate some sort of um, uh, message around this. You know, I'm sure uh, maybe Sona type would want to be referenced and and do a six door blog. Yeah, definitely. I I've uh, chatted with uh, Apu and uh, Patrick, um, so I think part of the work that I have, I'm going to try and wire back into the normal client. Um, mm -hmm. And then it can probably be a couple of blog entries. I've got the SIG store scaffolding working locally, an OIDC client working locally, and then a sort of mock of Maven Central. So I can try and someone could actually do all the testing themselves if they wanted to. So it's probably a few blog entries. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Uh, a quick suggestion is that we um, notify the tech that we're doing this since we're under the OpenSSF banner. Um, there was the package analysis project that went out a couple of weeks ago, and a lot of people were caught off guard that it was announced without anybody telling anybody. Um, 
So just it does it's not like you have to do it, it's just a courtesy. Is the work sponsored by the I'm just trying to think how does this map to the open SSF? Is it you're doing a demo as like this is of interest to you or or are they a sponsoring body? I'm just trying to uh, well, we're under the open SSF banner, are we? We're we're at yeah, SIG store are, but we, we do run with some autonomy around you know stuff that's happening in SIG store. Um if it's something that we're doing in conjunction with the open SSF, then that would be How, the case. However we want to do it. I was just interested like a couple of months yeah. ago, just trying to get it working for the ecosystem. And then I synced up with Dan and I'm going to do it on behalf of ChainGuard. Um, so sure. however best, I'm not in any rush to like push anything out. So however okay. we want yeah. people and people want probably want to watch the demos first and however you want to proceed is fine with me. Sure. Sounds good. In part, it's also about how you want to promote the event, right? Luke, if you want to amplify the attention mm -hmm. and use the open SSF as part of a communications distribution channel, yeah. then it's good to give them a courtesy heads up. Definitely, because yeah. that way, uh, you know, the, the project benefits because it gets uh, broader distribution and the open SSF feels good about it because it doesn't come out of left field where the friction occurs is when uh, people do things that you know closely reference the open SSF and the uh, association with it, but fail to give that heads up yeah. and causes some heartburn. Yeah, I guess my, my, my point was totally agree with that. Um, it's just the open SSF haven't really had any involvement in this. So Sonatype contacted Sigstore directly and the work's got underway. It's, it's. Um, I mean, we're a project in the Open SSF, but right. It's yeah. Really no, normal. I totally get it, and I don't want to be, you know, perceived as trying to throw up, you know, roadblocks. Sure. But if Sonatype turns around and says, in part of their press release to promote this, you know, we're also a proud member of the Open SSF. Yeah. It kind of goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think well, I, I, having worked at Linux Foundation, I, I think I have the the drill, so I can make sure. Yeah. Um, we just communicate with folks and yeah, some of it is good to get folks involved early and some is good to let folks know so they're aware. Um, but yeah, either way, happy to shout about this one in various ways and we can come up with the plan around that. Okay, just a little conscious of time. Uh, let's move on. Uh, anyway, super excited about the demo. So yeah, good luck with that and looking forward to, to seeing it in some form or the other. Let's go to cross plane SIG, to Jesse. Hi. Yeah, I, um, this is my second time attending the meeting, so uh, thanks. Okay. I'm, I'm actually here on behalf of Autodesk, but I've been doing work with the Crossplane community to implement uh, their config package signing. I just wanted to let folks know that we're going to kick off a special interest group within Crossplane in regards to config package signing, and the first uh, project that we're going to take on is going to be um, validation of, of cosine signatures. Um, within Crossplane. So thanks to everyone who, who pointed me at existing prior art. I really appreciate all the code snippets and so on. Um, and I will announce probably at our next meeting when we will have our subsequent SIG meeting for, for Crossplane specifically. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's amazing to hear. And uh, thanks for coming over to share that news. Right, Jack, go ahead. I'm, I'm sick of hearing me too. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes, uh, this is awesome. Um, when it's convenient for you, could you also join us in the securing software repos group? Because this sounds right up our alley and just be nice. Absolutely. To... Absolutely. I wasn't aware of it. I'm, I'm still new to this community, so I will, I will certainly uh, dig it up and, and be there. No worries. That's awesome. Thank you. Great. Okay. And finally, we've got moving Smime cosine to Sigstore. Uh, yeah, this is me. Uh, yeah, so this is just a follow up from uh, the the demo I gave last week uh, for git commit signing for uh, using ephemeral full seal certs. Um, so I'd really like to move this into the six store org. Um, so there's some discussion on the original issue. I went ahead and opened a, t a TSC issue. Uh, but yeah, if people want a plus one or if they have any comments, feedback, stuff like that, uh, yeah, feel free to leave it on the issue. So uh, I can't find my hand up. There we go. Um, so yeah, we this will be voted on this TSC. Okay, I mean it's pretty much a, a dead giver. It will go through from looking at the uh, 
responses we've had so far. It's just a bit of time for a quick discussion and a vote. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, names as well. Name bike shedding welcome. Okay, so going back to the agenda, we've come to the point we do introductions. Um, so Kenny, was that before introductions you had? Yeah, sorry, uh, got a quick, really silly question. I was trying to access the video recording from last week and mm -hmm. I get access, to, uh, please request access. So um, is there, I, I'm just trying to figure out like, what do I need to do? I click on the video link from last week's meeting in calendar and it's saying yes. access denied. So I'm just curious, what do I need to do to gain access to it? Luke, any thoughts? Yeah, I think this is probably um, a consequence of us. We've we've migrated the, the Hangouts account and the calendar entry has been recreated by Tracy. Okay, so where, where I've handed over the community meeting to Tracy, the videos are probably, it's I think something's probably got confused because both Red Hat and Chain Guard use Google services. Okay. And there's some sort of enterprise access control. So I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but I, I've got a feeling that's introduced some sort of gremlin, which is why it's suddenly asking for permission. So, so I'll take a look into it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? I, I that's probably what but let's take a look at it because yeah. <laughs> we terminated the old meeting series and started a new one. So they mm. shouldn't really be interfering with each other. Yeah. Like looking at the calendar entry, the one from last week is still created by Luke. Yeah. And oh, so whereas, you were looking at the one from this week. Uh, uh, I'm trying to, oh, so the recording for last week is tied to last week's calendar yeah. in, uh, entry. So that's where I'm trying to load the video from. Okay. And, um, um, yeah. yeah, let's take a look. And I do have access to YouTube as well. So if um, I can access it, we'll see if we can just upload it um, and you can find it on YouTube. Great. Thank you. It does look like I can access them all as well still. So, yeah. so, so I'll pull them down if need be. Yeah. Um, yeah, not sure why that's an issue though. Okay. Um, yeah, introduction. So this is the part uh, where if you're new or relatively new or you've been looking at a few meetings and want to introduce yourself, uh, please do feel welcome. I think we heard from Simon earlier. So Simon, if there's anything else you want to add, uh, please chime in. And yeah, I'll leave a brief pause. So anyone wants to introduce yourself, please do so now. Jesse. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I think that I introduced myself last week, but um, if, if, if I did not, uh, my apologies. I'm Jesse Sanford. I work at Autodesk uh, as a senior principal software engineer, but primarily um, sitting between developer enablement and security. So a lot of what I do is um, in regards to build pipelines and securing them. And so um, Cosign got on my radar about a year ago, and we've actually started to do some implementations. I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. It's great stuff. And I'm looking forward to uh, adding it into Crossplane. Awesome. Yeah, so glad you're here and um, yeah, that you're already up and running, updating the agenda and everything and demo soon, I think. Uh, Jeffrey, go ahead. Hey, I've uh, stopped in before, but I don't think I've ever introduced myself for those that haven't crossed paths with. I'm Jeff Borek. I've worked at an open source and communities at IBM for over a decade now and various capacities, uh, going all the way back to the early days of uh, Docker and even before then. Um, and I just want to congratulate um, the team on the recent news about SIGSTOR and Kubernetes. Uh, uh, it's a significant milestone and I think it's a great step forward. So congrats to everyone uh, around the table. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And yeah, I think what saying, um, that was a really big announcement and uh, there's a bit of scrambling uh, earlier last week to put that together, but it was really nice um, that we had lots of different community members, both from Kubernetes and from SIGSTOR, uh, contributing to the announcement. And it actually got picked up by like at least three different um, press outfits, wrote articles about it. 
Um, so yeah, really nice to shout about the work and to have that first at scale adoption in the Kubernetes community. So yeah, welcome Jeff and yeah, congrats all around everybody. Any other intros? Awesome. Okay, we'll just leave it at saying, yeah, no, um, thanks very much uh, for all your support as the kickoff chair meeting. Um, looking forward uh, to the next set of meetings. And yeah, also open to meeting folks. If anybody wants a sync up one-to-one, uh, -one, please hit me up on Slack. If you've got any ideas uh, about um, the community meetings and things you want to see more of or things you want to see less of, or just any other feedback, uh, you're happy to chat um, directly with folks. So uh, don't feel shy, just hit me up in the SIG store Slack and happy to set up some time. Okay, on that note, uh, yes, tons of stuff happening. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, catch you next week. And enjoy KubeCon for those who are going, that should be awesome. <laughs>